Good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Lagore, and welcome to the Skywatcher What's Up webcast. We do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. We cover everything from what's up in the nighttime sky to equipment to helpful tips and tricks on visual and imaging. And of course, at the end of the month, we have a special guest on to talk about their specialty in the field of astronomy. Um, so thanks for being on. Thanks for hanging out with us. Um, all these are generally live. So if you ever want to come back and check them out, um, like I said, we do these live, but, um, they are recorded. So you can always go back and watch an episode if you missed it. And we have over a hundred and who knows how many episodes at this point. So go back and watch them. Waste your Friday because you're not doing anything productive at work. Um, so a couple real quick things, uh, SOL, our solar uh, astronomy, solar observing lab, that's coming up on October 22nd. Um, we're gonna have a silent auction with a bunch of different stuff. Um, we've got a raffle going on. I will be putting details on those on the website um, and all kinds of fun stuff. It would probably help if you could actually see my screen as well. There we go, poof, there it is. Uh, so that's Seoul, October 22nd here in Phoenix, Arizona. We've got all kinds of cool stuff uh, that's going to be there, so you better be coming on out for that. Um, of course, we are also getting to the end of September. If I could get my life together, there's... Hi, Rachel. I accidentally pressed start. So this is Rachel. <laughs> um, Rachel's our special guest today. I didn't realize I switched to that screen. So anyway, this is Rachel. Um we're just going to go ahead and start. Hi. Never mind. <laughs> no announcements today. So it's like, um, so this is Rachel Freed. She is from, uh, it's the nonprofit now, right? Yeah. In, yeah. Yeah. Uh, she's from the nonprofit Instar, which if, if you want to explain what Instar actually is. So. It's the Institute for Student Astronomical Research. Spiffy. Uh, I know, right? <laughs> um, so if you've ever come to, I believe you've been to NEEF. Oh, yes. Yeah. If you've been to NEEF or AIC, um, usually Rachel is one of the most excited people running all over the conferences, being stoked <laughs> about something awesome. And she's <laughs> actually a, a very good speaker as well. Um, you're a really interesting person because when we go to these conferences, usually everyone's there to see, you know, the pretty telescopes and all the shiny stuff. And you are too, but you're approaching it way differently than so many of us are for just being like, yay, I got to see a, a plane <laughs> wave or whatever, which you're actually joining us from plane waves facility because it's their open right. house today. But, um, but I guess I should probably just ask, how do you, let me backtrack because you and I have so much energy that we're just going to bounce <laughs> off the walls. Um, how did you get started in astronomy? I ask everyone this question. So. Oh my gosh. Well, this goes way back. I've always loved astronomy um, since I was a kid, but actually it really was when I was started teaching in 2000, I was a high school chemistry and, and well, chemistry teacher. And then I said, hey, can I teach astronomy? Um, and they were like, sure. So I said, I better learn astronomy. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I was a member of a couple of astronomy clubs. And so, you know, I got to do all the star parties and the outreach. But when I was teaching, um, I really, I recognized right away that giving students a more authentic experience, like looking at the sky is amazing and learning about black holes and the life and death of stars is all exciting. But like, what if they could actually get involved in research? What if they could contribute to the scientific world? Um, that was like a big question for me. Like I knew that that would make it more meaningful. And so I had to figure out how to make that happen. That's sort of where, where this journey I'm on began. And that was well, that was a couple, couple years ago. <laughs> no, that's, I've, we were talking about this before we started. There's so many people who, you know, you go to these conferences or whatever, and you see everyone's taking these amazing pictures and stuff like that. But there's this very small, condensed group of people out there that have done astrophotography. They think it's cool. They've got all the gear, but it's almost like they hit like this proverbial wall to where it's just like okay it's not scratching that itch anymore i want to do right. something that is more productive i guess productive yeah. is a bad way of putting it because if you enjoy astrophotography that's great but they want to do something that has like actual forward meaning to things i guess if you guys yeah. know what i'm yeah. talking about 
and you get to talk to all these people because you do talks about things like that but because you're actually trying to segue people to being able to do research with their own equipment um and i know you right. one of the big projects i don't know if you want to explain what you one of the projects that you do with your students is something that's really obtainable for so many people with a telescope. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we do double star astrometry. And I should explain who my students are. So the first time I did this, it was I was in the classroom teaching high school students, and I had a small group of students. And we used a sort of a local, somewhat local observatory. We had to remote in and whatnot. But um, I then I met Russ Janae, who, you know, wrote the book on automating ro um, robotic telescopes and whatnot literally wrote some books on it. Um, <laughs> and he want, he had been teaching astronomy research seminars to high school and, and undergraduate students. And I had a lot of online teaching experience. And so we got together and we said, let's, let's make this institute, you know, over the course of a, a year or so, we brought people together and said, what would this look like? But um, so the students I have now are combinations of high school students, undergraduate students, high school teachers, and college professors who want to bring research programs to their students, but maybe don't have access to telescopes, haven't done this sort of basic astronomy that we do. So I have these huge groups of really diverse students, which are students and educators, and sometimes the occasional amateur astronomer, like you were mentioning, Kevin, who's like, I want to do research now. I know how to use my telescope. Let's let's collect some data. So I teach these seminars online. And, um, and what we do is it's the sort of the simplest, I think the simplest science you can do with telescopes, which is just measure where two stars in a double star system are relative to each other. You measure their position angle and their separation. And we look at stars that have been studied sometimes for 150 years, and they've been measured all that time. Maybe John Herschel discovered this double star and measured them, you know, and then over time we can get orbits. Um, and so that's, we contribute this data. We publish our research in the Journal of Double Star Observations of which I'm also now the editor. Um, <laughs> I wasn't for its first 15 years. Um, and then, uh, so the students, they learn how to do science, they learn how to use telescopes, they learn how to analyze data, and they learn how to write for publication. And as you know, we really need people to understand science and to be able to communicate science. And that's, um, that's the pro those are the projects that we work on. And I work with students and teachers all over the country and actually globally. I've had students in Australia and Chile um, and it's it's been really exciting. I've been doing this for about seven years now. I think that's what's kind of neat about the field of astronomy is once you kind of get your foot in the door, you kind of realize how close you are to actually being able to contribute to things. You know, unlike right. biology or chemistry or even like geology, which if you watch the Big Bang Theory, they will give total crap on <laughs> geology at that point. <laughs> but um, it seems like astronomy is something that scientifically is so easily obtainable to people with yeah. minimal investment and effort that you can actually start providing meaningful data to various projects yeah um, and that's what's kind of cool that you bring you kind of show people the door of hey come over here and see all this <laughs> nifty stuff we can do um but and I know that's kind of one of the reasons you are where you are now. You're actually in Adrian, Michigan for Plain Waves uh, Open House. And I, you work with them quite a bit now. Yeah, well, they've been an amazing supporter over the years of these of these seminars and, you know, helping to provide them to, to students who might not otherwise have access to them. And actually, um, last summer, I think it was, I had a group of 30 students and I think 10 of them were from this county that we're in here in Michigan. And so from college and high school students and teachers. Um, and actually in July, uh, I came out here to play with instruments and they, um, they had me put on a teacher workshop. So we had like 21 teachers from grades four through college instructors, you know, learning how to do this double star research. Um, and that was pretty awesome. And um, their students are getting published and I actually met the, the local superintendent today. So they're really interested. It's one of the things I love about Plain Wave and what they're doing in Adrian. And this is something that I'm going to be working on more back home in California, but um, building this community, like becoming part of the community and serving the community and building partnerships. And Plain Wave is really doing that with the schools and with everyone here. Um, and it's really exciting to be a part of um, 
So, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. There's um I'm being bombarded with questions already. Um <laughs> Is there anything for working professionals? I'll be going back to school later, but not not for anything in astronomy slash physics. I'm a computer slash data science guy. Oh, so, well, so, I mean, I'm just in this world of astronomy, um, but anyone can take, anyone can take these seminars. Anyone who's interested in astronomy, um, absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, especially if, if this gentleman's a, you know, computer and data guy, um, I would have to think, you know, the data that comes down from telescopes, you know, I think the world is always looking for what the next generation of like data mining software right. is going to be or, you know, whatever the case may be, you know, asteroid detection softwares and stuff like that. So it's right. like, if you know how to mess with computer and programs, you can write stuff that step ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the programs that we do, um, so one of my goals actually for INSTAR, this institute, um, is to expand beyond double star astrometry. That's sort of the stepping stone. But I've done a project with a student doing exoplanet transits. I've done a project with some other people doing an RR Lyra variable star. Um, and actually, I should tell you about the telescope. So people, like, even if they're not an amateur astronomer, maybe maybe everyone who's listening is an, an astronomer already, but even if people don't have their own telescopes, we have access to the Las Cumbres Observatory Global Telescope Network. So there's 10.4 meter telescopes around the globe in the southern and northern hemisphere. Um, and we have access to these. And what's really amazing is the images that we take, they go through a pipeline where we get um, six types of photometry on every star in the field. So talk about some data analysis. It's pretty amazing. And so people have been writing Python code and whatnot to analyze, you know, get light curves of all these stars. And, you know, just there's there is so much to analyze and study. It's really exciting. Yeah, and I, I know you're aware of this, but you have so many of these large professional observatories that are coming online, even you know, from the spectra world, you have uh, McDonald Observatory and their 10 meter telescope doing spectra of God knows how many stars <laughs> a night. Um, and then you have like the LSST that's coming online right. in the Southern Hemisphere, which will be capturing three terabytes of data a night. It's mm -hmm. like you like your project is kind of like the gateway to be like, here's how you understand what you're looking for. Here's what to keep an eye on. So then if you when these large observatories start providing public data because they don't have near the amount of people to go through it all, it's like right. you don't necessarily even have to have equipment to start making viable you know, research. You just have to understand what you're looking for in the data. And right. you can, I, I know people have discovered comets using SOHO data and they've never touched mm. a telescope before. And it's just, there's all this stuff out there now because there's so much information coming down from all the professional observatories that your program kind of opens the door being like, here's how you do that in certain right. ways and take advantage of that. And we could use small telescopes to do follow-up studies on objects of interest, like for how the tests, the test follow-up group for exoplanets, you know, there's, there is so much data and they, you know, need people to look at it. And one of the things that's interesting is um, collecting, collecting one's own data is always so different than analyzing, you know, getting to use the telescope and getting your own data and analyzing that. It's so different than analyzing the massive data sets so that it's really, um, it gives people this sense of, like accomplishment and ownership over it, which helps. There's all these this research about how that helps lead to um, persisting in science fields and you know doing better in in when you're getting degrees in science. You know this ownership of the data and all that um, is really helpful for that. And so it's exciting to be able to do follow up work. Yeah. I know that's a big what. I know that's something that really gets overlooked. And once you talk to people who do like astrometry all the time or spectra with their own equipment or whatever they're doing asteroid detection there's a million things you could actually do with your own equipment but you kind of realize owning your own equipment there's so many professional astronomers that would basically kill to have that amount of time <laughs> on a telescope that you know when it comes to the big pro telescopes you're fighting for a few days to get on right. and do your project and crossing your right. fingers that it's clear to do your project where yeah if you want to if you have a little observatory in the back or just something semi-permanent like you can do follow-up research night after night after night and 
it's almost more valuable because you have unlimited telescope time right um, at that point so I know there's a bunch of people out there that are doing the follow-up research, you know, crossing off the list of like, <laughs> this one's interesting, this one's, you know, man, or yeah. whatever it is. Um, you know, it's pretty cool to be able to do this, this uh, public research with your own equipment. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for people who would want to know more about how to get involved with your program, uh, I know you guys have a website uh, to get involved there. Yeah. Um, is it just like a sign up thing or do they email in saying I'm interested can, in being in a seminar? They can always email. Um, there is, we, I need to update the website. Our last seminar was actually this ended in August. So very recently, and we're going to have another seminar in um, probably starting in February. And so that will go up online and people can sign up on there. But in the meantime, they can always email. My email address is, is on our website. Cool. at infostar.org in for in number four star.org see if we can um, put that in the description below after the video is over so you guys yeah. can link over there um yeah. is there anything you know that you'd like to see more of i mean you've gone um to so many of these conferences like i have and you're kind of at a little one today but is there yeah is there anything you'd like so to see more from the amateur communities Absolutely, actually. So one of the things, so I've been going to, for example, the Society for Astronomical Sciences. Um, the, that's a group that uh, they are already doing research and publishing in the, the proceedings from conference and, and whatnot. And there's so much expertise and so much passion and, and like I would love to find ways to connect educators and students with those people that are already, they have the telescopes, they have the knowledge and experience, like let's connect them with students who know nothing about this, but love the space and, and have them work together. So one of the things that I do at NEF and at SAS and hopefully someday at AIC, um, I go to all these conferences that already exist and I put on workshops like during the conference or the day before, do I bring in all the local educators and I bring in students who have done the research in my programs? Because one of the things, um, in addition to learning how to do the research and publish, we want them to learn how to present and talk about their science to an authentic audience. And you get these amazingly authentic audiences at at these conferences where like at NEF there's astronauts and all the telescope makers and you know all these cool people and to have students present to them their research really helps build community, build a sense of, oh my gosh, I'm actually contributing science. So I would like for there to be more of that. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to build. For example, probably next year at the Texas Star Party, we're gonna have um, students come in and work with some of the some of the astronomers that are, you know, already there. They have, you know, they're doing their amazing pictures, but for our double star astrometry, we just need, you know, 50 seconds of images and we can measure stars and so maybe you know and we can bring students in and teach them the process of using the telescopes and analyzing the data so that's that's i i'm trying to build more connections and collaborations between the people that already love this stuff and know this stuff and those that want to learn how to do it um yeah. well that'd be cool because we're going to texas <laughs> star party too so we'll have to definitely awesome. bug you Jeff, yeah. we need to book our rooms for Texas Star Party. I've said that now publicly, <laughs> so now you have to do it. So, um, but no, that'll be awesome. And I, um, that's another thing that kind of blows me away about it. It's, you know, unlike astrophotography, it's like hours and hours of time. It's like for what you're doing, we're, we're talking about minutes. Minutes, uh, it's yeah. It's really not a lot of like effort in the in the world of just time on the telescope to capture right. what you're doing i know someone in here uh rachel do you folks do any spectroscopy um i did years ago from the wisconsin space grant consortium um i'm i know you kind of mentioned that you were going to expand beyond just the astrometry of binaries right that's something that i'm you know moving towards adding that in i what i really want is i want um, to provide experiences where anyone can come into Instar and say, I'm interested in doing a spectro spectroscopy project. I'm interested in doing a variable star project. I, you know, any of these and making those all available. A lot of, um, I'm, I'm restricted by my time mainly, you know, a lot of these things, I still need to learn how to, you know, do them better myself. I've done spectroscopy and like, like 
live stellar spectroscopy on you know at star parties but to do research I, I haven't done a research project on that but that's on my list of things to learn how to do and then teach people how to do yeah it really yeah. seems like in um in star is really kind of this you know web for lack of a better term where it's like you kind of bring all the pieces together into one spot so when people are like i'm curious about how to do this it's like well, if you come to us, we we have brought all the other pieces of the puzzle together so we can actually make it effective rather than kind of because I'm sure you found this where it's it's kind of like you're stumbling around in the dark to kind of find the pieces of like, well, how do I get involved in this and how do I take my data and provide it to this? It's like you've kind of done the background legwork on all of that. And now you just kind of have to plug the people into, okay, yeah. this channels through here and here's how you do this. And I like the fact that not only are you doing all this stuff but the fact that you're also teaching people how to present and how right. to speak and how to write their data where you're really getting a lot more than just simply using your telescope you're actually learning right. how to be a effective presenter and exactly. speaker yeah. which is a whole nother factor um, at that point <laughs> yeah 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 but that's pretty cool uh, that you guys are doing um, a lot of that. I have another question here. It's yeah. more of a equipment question, so I don't know if you know. <laughs> um, for double star measurements, you need a filler micrometer. Can these be purchased? Oh, uh, gosh. We don't use those anymore. Um, I know they did in these seminars in a few years ago, but because we're doing, um, we're doing with CCD – astrophotography now and then we use programs like astro image j and now there's other programs that we're using so we don't need the filer micrometer um so if you have a camera you don't need that you can actually measure the position angle and separation using astro image j which is free software that you can download yeah my friend at uh we had him on his name's gil escardo um he, we had him on last year or earlier this year um, he does follow-up work for TESS um, mm -hmm. on exoplanets. And that was something he had mentioned too, where it's like you kind of mm -hmm. think all these professional astronomers use this big fancy stuff. It's like, no, we use a freeware. You just download it online. And <laughs> psh, there it is. It's like, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's cool. <laughs> so, um, so is there, do you find there's any kind of holes in the amateur astronomy community for understanding you know, we're, we're so enamored with the latest equipment or the latest camera or the latest mount, you know, mm -hmm. but do you find there's maybe holes that people kind of get stuck in with astrophotography to where it's like, oh, well, if you just did this, you could do all this other cool stuff with your telescope at that point. Or um, I'm trying to figure yeah. out where I'm going with that, but you know. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's there's such there's people can go so deep down any hole in astrophotography. Um, you know, it's really interesting. So I also work with um, Dan Reichert of Skynet, um, the mm -hmm. Skynet Global Telescope Network, and um, um, he's developing a tool to do astrophotography, but um, with a with sort of a lot it's a lot easier to use than than what the astrophotographers who spend hours and hours um use and you're not going to get an apod necessarily out of it but um but it combines not only the images that he takes with skynet but uh wise infrared data and all these different infrared surveys and really this it's a combination of the art of astrophotography and the science behind it so looking at you know with different like the 12 micron versus the 22 micron wise data you get um cold dust versus hot dust or something like mm. that um and so looking at the science that these images because these images that people take that are incredible have so much science in them um and so there's it's, I, I wouldn't say it's something missing or something, but it's something that can be studied and, and addressed. And yeah, so you're we're kind developing of trying to tools. extract the information out of an astrophotography image for, yeah. Yeah. Cause 
you know especially these new cameras that are coming out they're so sensitive and you're getting all mm -hmm. this dust that no one ever really knew was there right and right. that's because i love all that you know dark and dirty dust i'm all about <laughs> that stuff but mm -hmm. um i have images it's like i didn't know that was there and right, right but now yeah is it like what is it is it cold is it hot is it molecular clouds like why is it there right. you know right. did it right. help with whatever's in the region is it foreground background, background. You know? exactly right and so um he's addressing all of that in, in the imaging that he's doing and he's recently started a blog to explain all the all of this sort of the the combination of the science and the beautiful astrophotography and it's really exciting and the reason we're um that we're that he's working on all this and um we're developing curricula for uh astronomy 101 programs because you know astronomy 101 is one of the very common um sort of general education courses at universities and colleges all across the country and often it's the last science that students will ever, the last formal science they'll ever be exposed to. And so we want them to really understand the nature of science and get some sort of scientific literacy so they can become, you know, good voting members of the public, um, you know. And so finding ways to engage because you really never run into anyone that's like, I hate space. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, sort of leveraging this this just innate interest in astronomy with teaching about science. Um, we're developing curricula for that. We already have a program for undergrad, the basic astronomy 101. We're now developing like the next level course. That's this multi-wavelength universe. Um, and it's really exciting to, to, to know that students will have access to do all this color imaging and image processing. That's, um, you know, not quite the level of, of the advanced astrophotography community but getting up there um, and it's part of their curriculum. It's really exciting. <laughs> you kind of brought up an interesting point there where everyone has kind of this innate interest in astronomy, like from there's the moon to, oh, I want to go buy a telescope and everything in between. Right. But most of the time you bring a telescope out anywhere, someone's <laughs> got every single person wants to have some interest because we all have that little seed inside of us that's like, wow, this is really neat. But to kind of take that, you know, ancient interest that's of <laughs> astronomy and kind of show that that is a factor of science. And if you have this kind of interest, maybe take the time to learn a little bit about why science is important. And through there, then, like you said, I don't want to get like political with it, but you do <laughs> start to get to the point where if by you taking this little bit of curiosity and unraveling it to being like, oh, this is how this works. This is what we're trying to achieve with all these scientific programs. This is, and then that unfolds into, this is why it was worth spending $8 billion on James Webb. And this is why right. Artemis is important. And right. this is why understanding medical science is important. But it's just like, right. by you taking the time to actually understand the process of science, and it's not just like, wow, that's, the, you know, saying wow that's cool that's the moon that's you like just scratching the surface of like <laughs> wow science is kind of neat isn't it it's like yeah it's right. kind of neat but if you just go a couple layers down you understand what all these scientists are trying to actually achieve in all the fields of the science and if you can be supportive of that you understand they're simply just trying to move the world forward so yeah exactly yeah yeah well put <laughs> but yeah it yeah. takes a process to get to that it, point. It does. So. It does. And I feel like um, sort of the way we do science in school has has taken some of the excitement out of it. And so my mission is to to bring that back, to, to give people authentic science research experiences, starting as, you know, at as young an age as possible, to really give them that hands on and intuitive understanding of, of what science is yeah and it's not just for the elite in any sense <laughs> yeah you're yeah. kind of trying to take the scientific method and actually show that it's you know it's something you can feel and touch like you can like yeah. by you asking why does this star do this it's like well instead of you going and reading it in a book <laughs> why don't we Let's do it, it. And, yeah. and just be like <laughs> wow because that that's why I do outreach. I meet so many teachers who are like, I'd love to do astronomy, but it's like, 
what am I supposed to do? Like, all I have is right. a book. The school's not going to go buy me telescopes. We barely use the microscopes they paid for. So it's just <laughs> kind of like we kind of blend our, our program. Be, like, yours probably is the backbone that the the teachers are missing because they don't have the funding or the time or whatever. Yeah. So you kind of come in which, and support it. So <clears throat> Yeah. Which actually is kind of an important point for my Institute. Like I know that, you know, science teachers, they, they're really busy. They don't have time to go learn astronomy and, and, um, you know, image analysis and all that stuff. And so I always commit when I have teachers that take my programs, I commit to helping them, um, and coming, I'll come in on Zoom and like teach their astronomy research seminar for them and with them and, and provide all of the support they need. Um, a really great, my favorite example so far, there was a professor in um, the, uh, Brigham Young University, Idaho, and he took my seminar and then he, he wanted to teach it at his university, but there was a lot of content in those first couple classes. And so he asked me to teach the first three lectures. So I zoomed in to his class in Idaho and gave the first three courses uh, or th three lectures. And then the next time he taught it, he said, can you just come in and do the first two? <laughs> so I did that. And now, of course, he teaches it all on his own. But it's kind of giving the teachers the support until they feel comfortable. And really, I mean, I would love for all institutions that have an interest to have an astronomy research seminar accessible to their students. And, and my goal for, for working with teachers is to give them the tools they need to run that. And, and then they get access to the telescopes that, that I have access to and um, whatever support they need. No, and that's, yeah. I think you and I are the, if we boil down like our mission fundamentally, <laughs> it, it's really to just show people how obtainable it actually is. And it's not yeah. that far away. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's I, every school I go to, astronomy is always the bottom of the list. It's the most exciting right. science, but it's the bottom <laughs> of the list. Yeah. Because yeah. it's like, well, we just don't get to it in our curriculum. And, oh, right. it's whatever the state is. And I don't know enough about it. Or it always gets the, you know crap into the stick a lot of times but it's the one <laughs> yeah, that gets yeah. the most excitement, excitement when you finally show up with you know whether we're showing a prominence on the sun or you're mm -hmm. you know i'm sure you've done it where you show up at a school you set up a telescope and obviously you're not taking pretty pictures but it's like that dot right there you know if we do these measurements it's like okay well it's a bunch of numbers it's like yeah but do you know what that means it's like right. we just figured out that it's this and just to be right. like it's not that hard it's like <laughs> but the right. fact that you just calculated an orbital period or distance or whatever the fit yeah. you know even with spectra yeah. where it's like now we know it's moving away from us it's like right <laughs> what That's like huge yeah yeah it, it just it drives me nuts and I'm sure it drives you up the wall where you walk <laughs> into a school and it's just like, well, we kind of touch on it in the book. And as right. long as we get it on the test, we're good. It's just like every teacher oh, I talk to know. has such aspirations, but they're so defeated because it's like they just right. there's no wiggle room to do anything. So to step in there and be an assistant to be like, here's how we're going to make this work. It's like it really gets it into gear you just have to yeah. dump gasoline on the the, the fire at that the fire. Point, so. <laughs> right right which you're right. really good at because you're so energetic about it you're just like <laughs> it's a science it's so... <laughs> right right well kevin you know it's also interesting um i'm i think i told you i'm working on a phd in astronomy education so so i've helped get access to telescopes for hundreds, thousands of students around the world. And now there's a question of like, what is the impact of that? Like, does that change anything for them? And so I really wanted to share with everyone what we've found so far, because it's it's really exciting. So there's this concept in education of self-efficacy, this sense of I can do this. I can learn how to use a telescope. I can manipulate astronomical images. I can learn astronomy, etc. So self-efficacy is one of the um, best predictors of of success in science and mm. STEM careers, um, and one of the best predictors of, of conceptual change, like actually understanding things. And so I developed um, in my research a, a survey that students take before and after a semester of astronomy, and they um, they found with 
you know, implementing this telescope curriculum that we have out of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, um, that students' self-efficacy increases tremendously. We found mm -hmm. huge effects. So that's really, you know, they, they have access to telescopes and they're manipulating images and all of a sudden they're like, wow, I can do this. And that's, you know, really fundamental to keeping people in, on a science track. And that's exciting. But even more exciting um, in sciences, especially like physics and in math and the hardcore sciences, um, women tend to have lower self-efficacy. And this is just a thing that's known. Um, and they have lower self-efficacy even when they have better grades and are succeeding in courses. They don't have this automatic sense of, wow, I can do this. Um, but we found that actually a semester where they're using these remote telescopes in their astronomy 101 classes closed that gender gap. So at the beginning of the semester, when they took the survey, the females had way lower self-efficacy. And by the end, they the female and male students had the same self-efficacy. It was um, statistically insignificantly different. <laughs> so um, and that was really amazing. So we're really finding ways to close the gender gap, which is really exciting for me because I, you know, having been an amateur astronomer for 22 years, um, I see the gender disparity and just getting more girls and, and young women into science and STEM is really uh, another part of my mission. And so it's really exciting to have sort of this research base showing like, wow, we can actually make a difference. And it's, you know, using these professional telescopes because the telescopes we have access to are the professional telescopes. They're the telescopes that did like gravitational wave optical follow-up observations and stuff. And now we have students in their little, you know, college undergraduate classrooms using them. Um, and it's, it's so exciting. <laughs> I think that's really cool that, um, I mean, like I said, you and I have been to a lot of trade shows. <laughs> when you show up, the demographic is yeah <laughs> it's not it's, equal <laughs> there's very few women rolling around which it's astronomy everyone looks the same in the dark it doesn't matter so <laughs> it's um but it's amazing how there's not more women involved in astronomy period so it's kind of it's awesome that a you're bringing in research but then second not secondly but you know you kind of have like yeah. this double barrel approach to where it's like you know <laughs> research and science but more women at the same time so it's just like <laughs> yeah. kind of like flying these double flags um, of <laughs> representation but it's yeah. it's cool to see someone like you who just who's picked this up and has in my mind i can't think of anybody else and at least the bubble that i know who's right. kind of the tip of the spear of right. you know what you're trying to do especially when you go to the not that there's anything wrong with these conferences that we go to but it's just you don't have a lot of women or real science you know right in there and it's it kind of skirts so much so it's right on that line to where it's like just someone like you just needs to nudge someone over to be like wow i could do science with my stuff it's like wow or yeah you know, I'm sure it's pretty neat to go to like do these conferences and it's like, here comes Rachel to talk about, <laughs> talk about all this stuff. But then, you know, you're so energetic about it in a positive way that, you know, it's kind of how I like to approach things where it's like, if you're stoked about something, you're probably going to spark that with somebody else because it's like, wow, she thinks it's really cool. So I should think it's really cool. But then to double on that, where it, you kind of come into this where it's like, was you know a young woman could be like wow like she's a woman and she's done all this stuff and she's doing this cool thing like i could do something like that and exactly. then it starts that whole you know you're you're really just kind of the spark and yeah, that's you just kind of want to share your what excites you with somebody else and in hopes that you kind of hit that kindling and it ignites the yeah, next generation yeah. to take the flag and keep going so yeah yeah, and uh, that, that enthusiasm that you and I both share for, you know, at the telescope, it gives people permission to also feel that and express that instead of being like, oh, that's cool, Saturn's rings. They can be like, oh, my gosh, it's Saturn's ring, you know, the way that, that I don't know if you've done, <laughs> like, I know you work with, like, college and high school. Yeah. My favorite thing to do at, like, a high school or college level is when you get, like, a group of, like, jocks. And... <laughs> 
you know, they're there because they have to be, and it's like they're mm-hmm. getting credit, and they're like, okay, I guess that's cool. Let's leave because we got our credit. Bye. <laughs> There's always one that uh-huh. ends up staying mm-hmm. after the friends leave, and they're like, wow, this is kind of cool. It's like, aha! Uh, <laughs> found <gotcha>. you! It's <laughs> like, like, we gotta release the inner nerd in you. It's <laughs> like, but it yeah. without a doubt there's someone there and it's just kind of once again you're just trying to like tap that little seed that's in all of yeah. us and it's like yeah. see like you yeah. go destroy each other on the football field all you want but it's like when the brain cells are gone after that like <laughs> you could do some science at the same time but right. it's it's fun to it i always like to tap and see who's gonna be the one that Right. really takes and really engages on that and you as a teacher for all these years I'm sure you've seen you've had a ton of students I'm sure walk through your classrooms and your seminars and every now I, I am absolutely certain that you have a list of mental uh, people in yeah. your head that you know yeah. you hit the spark with and it's yeah. rare yeah. but it's ultimately There's always someone yeah at the end of the day you're like that's why I do what I do because, totally. But... Yeah. W- one of my favorite things along those lines to do at our local observatory when I, I'm running like our RC20 with the cameras and everything, like I'll have a group of kids and then there's always, like you say, one or two that get really excited and want to stay behind. And then I'll have them run the telescope and, t- and, and hit the take image button. And it's really cool to see them like kind of have that, that, that a spark or that that moment where they're like, whoa, I just took the picture. I just moved the telescope, sort of taking something that seems so out of reach and, and powerful and like they get to be in control. And then that, that can be really transformative for some of those little kids for sure. Yeah. I guess (laughs) you could call, if I had to call it something, I'd probably call it the Excalibur moment where it's like you pulled (laughs) the sword from the stone and it's just like, I did it. It's so, you know, (laughs) but it's, It's such a rare thing, and I wish every person who did it had that moment. But, I mean, that's right. kind of why it's few and far between. But when you do see it take light, and especially when that person comes back through your door, they're like, so I read right. this, and now I want to do this. Right. And it's like, here we go. We're going to yeah. snowball <laughs> effect this real quick. And just, mm, it just needs to push right. down the mountain at this point. But, right. um I'm sure you have, like, even just some of the teachers that you've worked with, I'm sure it's really gratifying to where it's like, hey, could you do the first three presentations? Yeah, no problem. Next semester, could you do the first two? And then right. in a year or two, it's like, they're doing it. And it's like, the, yeah. you got the wind under the wings and they've taken off. And it's like, we that's exactly what we're here to do. So Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I'm, I'm sure it's very fulfilling to see especially now that you have the organization and stuff like it's, it's a real branded thing and you have people coming to you now. So I'm sure at the end of the day, when you see your program being effective and taking hold and doing what the goal is, is very fulfilling at the end of the day. So it is, it really is. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, so we're getting to the end. I'm going to see if there's any questions for you floating around here. Um, I don't see anything at the moment. I know we kind of pulled some in earlier. Yeah. Um, I had a question for you. We yeah. have the 2024 eclipse coming up. Is there any kind of scientific stuff that you have planned for that? Because I know that's kind of a unique opportunity. So, so far, I myself don't have anything planned. Um, I know people are going to recreate the Eddington experiment like they did in the last couple eclipses. Um, I, I know some people are talking about, um, doing some balloons, some, you know, putting up some balloons up there to measure, uh, changes as, as the eclipse occurs, um, with their students. But I myself don't have anything planned except, gosh, it would be great to go see an eclipse again. (laughs) Yeah. I wasn't sure. I I remember talking to Jen Winters from Daystar and- Mm -hmm they were talking about the various experiments that people could do, you know, with, you know, gravitational lens of the lensing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All this fancy dancey stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, I wasn't sure. I mean, after seeing 2017, 
in person it yeah the first thing that goes through my mind it's like yeah i don't care about the star behind the sun i want to see that so, that's but it's, right it's right. like this is only my second one i don't know about the, all of you that have seen 15 of them but it's like <laughs> i don't have time to measure like bending right. light the at this bending point of the stars yeah so i'm just trying to deal with my mind bending around this whole <laughs> thing so yeah i will say that I, what I would I would probably do differently from last time because I saw the 2017 eclipse um, and I was had two telescopes running and I was trying to take pictures and capture everything and and it went by so fast it felt like 10 seconds if we if we hadn't been recording it I wouldn't believe it was as long as it was and so I might do that differently I might just try to like just observe <laughs> yeah well, this one's nicer because if you're in certain spots it's like four and a half minutes of that's so long so it's oh like my gosh. you've got but it was amazing on 2017 how it's like it's like two minutes or something. It's like yeah. two minutes is short, but it's it's some time. Yeah. It was yep, done. Exactly. It was just it was like, done. Well, exactly. And then after it's over, you're kind of looking around. It's like, well, now what do we do? It's like, <laughs> We've been I planned for, for so five long. years and <laughs> now it's over. It's like we could watch the rest of the eclipse. It's like, that's boring now. It's like. <laughs> Seen it. <laughs> I've, I've had a couple people who were went to me they're like oh yeah we saw it. we were like 99 98 percent it's like oh no you have no idea you what you're talking it. about at this point <laughs> right. like right. you might as well have just failed at life at that point because <laughs> it's like you either saw it or you didn't it's you didn't. like there's none right. of this like 95 99 percent crap right. it's like totality <laughs> or nothing so and i'm sure you feel the same way the minute totality is over it's like how do I get to the next one? It's right, like, right. what child can I sell to get to the next <laughs> one? So, but that's how we felt at the end of 2017. I didn't even finish watching the rest of the eclipse. It was like, eh, they're, 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 annular, pff, lunars, pff, like right, right. all the other, all the other eclipses could just screw off at this point because totality <laughs> is like it. So amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we did put, uh, your, where'd it go? It's in the chat somewhere. There it is. Uh, in the chat, we put, uh, Rachel's website. It's in for star.org. Um, maybe we can pop that back in there again, or Jared or Jeff, if you guys could pop that back in there again, if you want to know more about Rachel's, uh, organization, um, you guys are a 501 C so, so I'm assuming yeah. you can accept donations if people want to support oh, you. Oh so. yes, we can. <laughs> Give us money. <laughs> <laughs> and that goes, that would always go to supporting students um, taking the seminars. Yeah. Yeah. We love support. <laughs> yes. No, that's so yes. If you've got some disposable income, throw it over to Rachel and her team and <laughs> let them, uh, expand the minds of many people um if you want to know more you can actually go to their website we'll pop that back in the chat and you know you can there it is it's in the chat now so you guys can go over there check it out um and you said if you want to get involved for like the next seminar you're probably looking at the spring um yeah of 2023 yeah. so and at cool. this point people can just email me yeah you should come to yeah. seoul next month i would love to <laughs> if i had money to fly you here i would but i'm doing this on an incredibly thin budget so it's yeah like, yeah but that's all right so yeah you're no, busy I blowing travel, people's minds <laughs> yeah i travel a couple times a month right now for work so i'm like i don't know if i could fit anything else in <laughs> yeah i can pencil you in between this and this and it's only right. five minutes so it's like <laughs> But, uh, well, thanks for hanging out with us this morning. Sure. I know you're, especially because you're busy this weekend, so I'm glad we could, like, yeah. you know, get on your schedule. But Yeah, no, it's been really great. But thanks, hopefully Kevin. we'll see you uh, in the near future. So Yeah. <laughs> um, do you have a Patreon for reoccurring support? Oh, my goodness, no, but now I know we need to set one up. <laughs> <laughs> we will set up a patreon yes. by the end of the day it's like so... <laughs> stop Seriously, the press by the end of the so day like, so... <laughs> so there you go you just gave rachel another thing to do on her list so because she's not you know busy enough so um let's see is there any more questions here for rachel i don't see anything 
thing. Um, there's a couple questions here for, I guess, us. Which of the three telescopes is best for beginners? Evo Lux 62, Evo Star 72, or Sharp Star 61? Any Skywatcher is the best telescope to get involved with. And a Spree 150 would be an awesome beginner telescope. No. Um, depends on what you want to do. If you're doing astrophotography, probably the Evo Lux 62, Evo Star 72, that works good too. Um, is there extension on the totem uh, for Florida folks? Uh, I'm sorry I got hit by Ian. I'm going to say no. Um, it's weather. It happens. And next month we're going to have a new target. Rachel, I don't know if you know, but um, we do a target of the month now for Skywatcher. Uh, so we give you a challenging target. And if you do it, we give you a patch that says oh, Skywatcher cool. totem on it. So, um, cool. uh, but yeah, so. We'll just have to make one of the challenges. It's like, you have to do astrometric research of a binary star. And <laughs> everyone's going to be like, uh, it's like, go I'll talk to Rachel. So it's like, <laughs> so, but, uh, I think that's everything. So yeah, go set up a Patreon, Rachel. And, uh, um, <laughs> but thank you so much for hanging out with us. I will let you get back to playing sure. with big telescopes. Tell Rick hi and that he needs to be on our show because we've asked him multiple times. But um, okay, I'll tell him. Uh, All but, right, um, should I sign off now? Yeah, I'll get you there. Uh, thanks everybody for watching. Uh, we will see you guys next week for What's Up in the Sky. And Rachel, have a good weekend. Thank you. You too. See ya. <laughs>